Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and now it's time for part two of my history and physics of nuclear devices. Going nuclear. In the early days of the Manhattan Project, they weren't initially concerning themselves with building a weapon. What their aim was, was to construct a reactor using natural, unenriched uranium and graphite blocks as a moderator. Enrico Fermi at Columbia University in New York started this. He built a couple of uh, piles, neither of which achieved criticality. Then Arthur Compton, in an effort to eliminate redundancy, brought Enrico Fermi and teams from uh, Berkeley and from Princeton together at the University of Chicago, where their combined efforts eventually led to the world's first artificial nuclear reactor. The Chicago Pile 1 was built in racquetball courts underneath the spectator stands at Stagg Field. It contained six short tons of uranium, 50 short tons of graphite, and uh, control rods made of cadmium sheets basically nailed to wooden strips. It went critical at 3.25pm on the 2nd of December 1942, generating a whole half watt of power. This was deliberately kept low because, unlike modern reactors, this had no shielding or cooling, the kinds of uh, features that you would expect on a modern reactor. With the successful demonstration of a self-sustaining nuclear reactor achieved, it would eventually be dismantled and the pieces would be used to build an even larger device in more appropriate locations so that the research could be carried out to support the Manhattan Project and its goal of weaponizing the technology. Now, the main difference between a controllable nuclear reactor and a nuclear weapon is the neutron multiplication factor. This is a number which measures how the chain reaction grows or ebbs with each generation of fissions. If the factor is less than 1, then the chain reaction slows down. If it is greater than 1, it grows. An important feature of reactors is the ability to adjust the neutron multiplication factor and keep it close to 1. This is done using control rods, which are essentially rods made of some material that absorbs neutrons, such as cadmium. The time between generations is roughly the time it takes for a neutron from a fission event to travel through the fissile core, possibly get scattered off of moderator and eventually hit another atom and generate a fission event. Now this has a lot of variables and it depends on what you're doing, but in a bomb which is using fast unmoderated neutrons, this time is typically about 100 nanoseconds. In a power reactor where the neutron has to get scattered several times, it might be as high as 100 microseconds. But with such short generations, the reaction is highly sensitive to the multiplication factor. If your multiplication factor is 1.01, that is just 1% above being critical. And you're working in a thermal reactor where you're talking 100 microsecond generations, then about every 7 milliseconds you're going to double your power output. That means in less than a second you will go from zero power to essentially explosive levels of power if you're just relying on the initial neutrons generated from each fission. So you might wonder, how do power reactors manage to keep this under control? Well, in a stably operating core, there's actually two sources of neutrons to be concerned about. The first are the neutrons being generated directly from the fission, but the fission products that come out of each fission frequently are radioactive and some of those will be neutron generators. They will throw out neutrons when they decay. The time that it takes from the initial fission to the daughter products decaying can be a few minutes. So in addition to the neutrons being generated directly from the fissions, you've got a background from uh, reactions that have happened over the last few minutes. These are called delayed neutrons and the neutrons that are generated from the fission events are called prompt neutrons. Now this delay gives us a chance to actually control a power reactor. What you do is you make sure that your reactor is just subcritical for the prompt neutrons, but when you add in the 3% or so of delayed neutrons, that brings you over or just up to the 1.0 multiplication factor. So that means that you can control your reactor by moving control rods in and out on a time scale of minutes rather than microseconds.
By the way, when a power reactor goes critical without the need for those new delayed neutrons, that's called going prompt critical. And that is never a good thing. Unless, of course, you're wanting to build a nuclear bomb. So a power reactor wants to sit exactly at the critical mass, whereas a bomb, it wants to have its multiplication factor be as high as possible. It wants to be super critical. And that causes the power to grow rapidly, as quickly as possible, before the laws of physics realize that the core has just vaporized itself and should be expanding into the neighboring universe. To make a nuclear weapon work, you need to assemble a supercritical mass of fissile material, but you have to do it using subcritical masses of material which have to be kept apart until it's time for the weapon to detonate. Now, the simplest way to demonstrate this is to look at the little boy. This was the first weapon ever used in war, but it wasn't the first weapon tested. And the reason is the little boy used a gun type assembly mechanism, which was considered to be so simple compared to all the alternatives, that a full up test of the weapon was never carried out before its use over Hiroshima. In a gun type device, the critical mass is stored in two parts and the detonation process involves, involves firing one chunk into the other using a self-contained gun barrel inside the bomb's casing. The two parts are designed to fit neatly into each other. In the case of the little boy, there was a cylinder which fits neatly into a sleeve which makes up the other half of the core and therefore turns the two subcritical masses into a critical mass of fissile material able to support the nuclear chain reaction. Now, as an aside, many diagrams actually get the design of the little boy backwards, showing a cylindrical slug being fired into a hole in reality, it was the other way around, with the cylinder being the target and the sleeve being the projectile that was fired down the barrel. Now, the reason for this unintuitive design comes down to the target being more than just a block of fissile material, but it also includes the structure around it. When the core is assembled, it would be surrounded by a casing of tungsten carbide, which served two very important purposes. Now, the first purpose was to hold the core together a little longer, keeping the reaction going so that more generations of fission events can happen. Now, tungsten carbide is strong stuff, but in the heat of a nuclear explosion, this tensile strength literally evaporates. And all that's left to hold back the nuclear hellfires for a fraction of a second is the density. It's literally momentum that is holding this together a little longer. And tungsten carbide is pretty dense material. The second function of the tungsten carbide is to act as a neutron reflector, such that the neutrons, which would otherwise escape the reaction, had a chance to be reflected back inside the core. Now, a neutron reflector is what you place next to the fissile mass and it essentially reduces the critical mass a little. So a subcritical object can become critical when you bring it next to a neutron reflector. And that meant that the sleeve, which fit in around the outside, if it had had the tungsten carbide around it, then it would have had to have had lower, uh, a lower critical mass, or it would have to be of lower mass. So by separating the slug from the reflector, you ended up being able to put even more fissile material and get even more boom out of the little boy. So even although it's not fissile and doesn't release any energy on its own, the tungsten carbide's role as tamper and neutron reflector makes a significant contribution to the yield of the weapon in the microseconds that the fission reaction is running. But even before the core is assembled, things can happen very, very quickly. So when the gun fires, the projectile moves down the barrel at about the speed of sound. When it gets to the end, it doesn't actually need to stop because when the fission reaction kicks in, it lasts for only about one microsecond before the device is destroyed. And in a microsecond, you move about 0.3 millimeters. However, during the device assembly, there is a moment when the mass is actually critical, but not fully supercritical. It's possible that the reaction could start in this last millisecond or so. And if it did, uh, the device would explode, but it wouldn't explode with the yield that was intended. This is called pre-detonation. Now, you might wonder, how does the nuclear reaction actually start? Where do the first neutrons come from? And actually, in uranium, 
The nuclei have a small chance to spontaneously fission all on their own without being hit. Uh, they will generate the daughter products and a bunch of neutrons, and that can start the reaction. For every kilogram of uranium-235, you get about 0.3 fissions per second. So for the whole critical mass, that would be about 15 for the whole assembly. Uranium-238 is worse. It generates about 13.6 spontaneous fissions per kilogram per second. Now, after you account for the chance of absorption and escape, most sources estimate that the chance of pre-detonation in Little Boy would have been about 10%. Also, Little Boy included a neutron generator codenamed Abner, and honestly, I can't find any information about this. It wasn't strictly necessary for the device. But as we get on to more uh, complex devices, neutron generators are going to become very, very important. And that's where I'm going to leave this. Part 3 will go into the more complex plutonium implosion devices. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.